calculus about combining astrometry and direct imaging. And too bad that Fritz is here. <laughs> I'm sure he has something to say. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I wanted to see what um, the talks were about yesterday since I wasn't here, but they're not on the, on the web page. Uh, they will be. Yeah, so if I repeat stuff, I'm sorry. Um, I did try to look. Um, so thanks everyone for um, coming this morning because I see that there's a lot of like, it's the fifth day of this conference glaze a little bit, which is totally fine. Like I've been here an hour and I have glazed. Um, so um, thanks for all for coming um, this early um, this day. Um, so what I wanted to, um, or what I was asked to talk to you guys about today was the ways in which we can combine um, astrometry and direct imaging. So it's a little bit different than the astrometry you, I think you heard about yesterday. Um, where you're trying to find astrometric planets um, and that what we're trying to do is now get astrometry of directly imaged planets uh, for the purposes of mostly for orbital characterization. So um, the subtitle of this talk was um, an idea that we should be breaking um, a micro arc second barrier, so one uh, 10 to the minus six of an arc second. Um, so I decided to change it when I was going through this to like uh, the milliarc second barrier, so we're, we haven't even gotten really to that point yet. Um, so for just in terms of thinking about the future, since this is a future direction section, um, it, I think that this is where we need to get to first before we can start even considering going to the microarc second level. Um, so first I'm going to just give motivation about why we, why we care to do precise astrometry for direct imaging. So um, luckily I had, with the talk before this, there's a really nice intro to orbits, and so the point of this is primarily um, to use orbital information about the, uh, that you can get from astrometry to say something about um, the evolution of directly imaged planets. So um, this is a nice press release picture of, oh, I didn't realize that that was, there's a um, of the beta pictoria system. So I'm gonna talk about this one a lot because there's a lot of interesting information that we've gotten from the orbit of beta pen. Um, so the kinds of orbits that you're now going to be seeing are not the ones like you saw before, where it's sort of a, um, you know, an RB curve or a light curve. Um, you're going to see what we see with um, basically astrometric binaries or binaries where the points are resolved on the sky. So we're using that extensive literature um, that's existed for hundreds of years on that topic instead. Um, so we're going to use this information to say something about um, the orbits um, and the evolution. So I think. A few days ago when you were talking about direct imaging, you guys got to hear about um, how we have to use uh, relatively price of science astrometry just to even say that the planets are really bound to the star. Um, so that's sort of the first step and why we want to do this. Um, so, you know, we've spent, there's probably, I wish somebody would do a tally of the amount of hours of telescope time people have wasted, like, not wasted, but it's important to do it, but following up little dots next to bright things that turn out not to be real, which is why. If you look at the plots of all of the like um, detections like we saw just before, there's like so few direct imaging ones because most of them are, are background objects and it's so sad. Um, so um, the first thing you want to do is confirm their association um, and then of course learn about the orbits um, as, a, as a next step, uh, which requires like measuring the positions of the planet relative to the star to high precision. So this is just another image of another directly imaged planet that was found with a VLP. So I'm going to show hopefully lots of different examples of directly imaged planets from different locations. So um, when we're talking again about the orbits of directly imaged systems, these are really wide systems. And so, you know, if there's something like, in best case scenario, we're talking about a 10 AU separation, but usually you're more um, in the tens to hundreds of AU. So if you use Kepler's laws, that's, you know, many, many hundreds of years, period. Um, so how can we learn anything <laughs> in the fraction of the time when our careers, let alone like the lifetime of, um, you know, astronomy in general, how can we say anything about um, the orbital properties of these types of, these types of planets? Um, so you can do it statistically, um, and you can also um, use, you know, statistical information about the most likely parameters that you'll get, in particular eccentricity is one that we really want to get, um, to try to say something about um, the formation or subsequent dynamical evolution of the directly imaged planet system. So this is just an example oh, I did it again. from a paper, a theoretical work by Chatterjee in 2008. Um, and what they did was they simulated, I think, a system of three large planets. And they just ran them forward in time and saw how they interacted with each other. Um, and the goal was to see, um, in a large suite of simulations, would you get um, objects out at the distances of directly imaged planets? Because if you think about formation, um, and sort of the typical um, formation models have a really difficult time forming directly imaged planets. 
um, at large, large separations, these huge, these big, you know, 10 Jupiter mass things. Um, so what they found is when they had two of the planets in their simulation survive, so what's being plotted here is a semi-major axis versus um, eccentricity. Um, they saw that the ones over here at large separations, like we're talking about, um, tended to have large eccentricities. And so that's something, even with only a small fraction of the orbit covered, we could actually determine whether things are sort of large or small eccentricities. Um, so that's exciting. That tells us, that could tell us maybe if all the directly imaged planets were seen were scattered out there um, or if they form there. Um, another thing that you can learn is use the orbital information to highlight um, an interesting events that might occur in a system. So I'm coming back to Beta Pictoris as an example of this. So um, the example is that the possibility that the Beta Pictoris planet B might transit. So um, beta pick, so obviously this is a really, really bright star, beta, <laughs> that means it's the second brightest star in the constellation Pictoris, um, was, has been studied for a number of years, you know, photometrically. And so um, what happened was people were looking back at, you know, data from a long, long time ago, but not that long, I mean, the 80s, it's a pretty long time ago. Um, and what they found was that in November of 1981, um, if they look at multiple different um, wavelength ranges, they saw this dip um, in the light um, that occurred across all the different wavelengths. So they got really excited that maybe something was transiting beta pick. Um, and so um, this was in 1997 that this particular paper came out when they, they talked about um, this big dip here. Um, and then you fast forward several years to 2009 and lo and behold, there's a, a large dip. Sorry, I lost this. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Maybe I'll just hold it. I'll just hold it. Um, so here's this planet, and you can also see that, like, um, they had discovered uh, several years before that this was a large debris disk, which was also viewed roughly edge on. So we got really excited that this could possibly be the cause of this transit. Um, and so one of the ways to figure that out is to try to get the orbital properties of the planet. So people have been working on this for a while. So one of the first um, one of the first papers that actually looked at this was Chauvin in 2012. Um, and so what you're seeing now is sort of the typical way that we plot orbits um, in sort of the direct imaging world, um, is we look at um, X and Y um, and just plot the positional data points that we measure. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this in a second, relative to the um, center of the system, which in this case is the, um, the star. So the star is usually a zero, zero. Um, in this case, they've also changed the projection. So instead of viewing the actual um, projection of on the sky, what this orbit looks like, which I'll, I'll show in a second, um, they've changed it so that it's basically you're looking top down and this is the direction to Earth. Um, so in any case, here's some different orbits that they found were allowed. Um, and they found that it was the tra a transit was allowed to within one sigma. So this was really exciting. Um, and they could start to constrain when that transit would actually happen. Um, and I believe this was in 2017, the next one would be happening. Um, so then fast forward two years, you get more astrometry, um, you try to improve your precision. So now what we're seeing is a plot from Eric Nielsen's paper on this. Um, and this is actually what we see like projected on, on the plane of the sky. So, um, and then this is what the best fit orbit they got. Here's their astrometry. Um, and they also, they added some data points, but also found that transit was allowed within one sigma for, the, for this planet. So in this case, um, the, best, the best fit was like 88 and a half. Um, degrees for inclination, um, which in the, in the previous plot you'd see a lot of stuff transiting at 88 and a half degrees inclination, but these are, you know, this is a 10 AU separation object, so um, you have to be close to 89.9 or something like that to get a transit. All right, in the same year, we have more data from Macintosh et al. from uh, the Gemini Planet Imager. This is a, a different way of displaying orbit, so instead of doing an XY projection, you do time versus the change in X and Y. Um, and then these, these lines show um, the orbits, the potential orbits that are consistent with those. And um, they found that only, it was only a 4% probability, so now the probability is going down, which is bad. Um, then you get uh, one year further, a little bit more data, more astrometry drops down to 0.06% probability, which is a similar kind of plot where it's X and Y versus time. And then finally, um, uh, Jason Wang et al. in 2016, decided that it was ruled out to 10 sigma by adding all the data together. Um, but what they did find was that, um, 
so what, what you're looking at here, now this is a, a completely different thing, is a zoom in on just kind of the closest region to the star. Um, and the blue represents um, the best fit orbit. So you see that it basically doesn't cross through zero, zero. So the star isn't, or the planet's not gonna transit the star, that's the size of the planet right there. Um, but these, um, these colored regions here represent the size of the Hill sphere. So I thought maybe, and what a lot of people have talked about is maybe that, um, that if there's circumplanetary material, that might be what is causing transit. So all of this is an example of why we, why we care to do this for direct energy. Um, and then the last thing actually that you can do, and another example from Beta Pit, um, is that when you have, often directly imaged planets are usually found in young stellar systems. So a lot of times there's disks still um, hanging around, so debris disks. Um, and a lot of times the debris have really interesting structure in them and people want to understand what's generating that structure. So um, one way you can get some of the things that we see is by the interaction of the material and the disk with the planet, uh, basically and gravitationally. So what uh, Max and collaborators were looking at was how um, with their new orbits that they had modeled from getting good astrometry, how you might be able to generate some of these disk features like a warp, for instance, like we see in the beta pick debris disk, which is um, very, very interesting. So that's, that's why we care about doing orbits, even for these super, super long period systems as best we can. Okay, so with that motivation, I'm gonna talk about what we actually want to measure and how, how we do it. Um, so this is now a cartoon um, to demonstrate our measurement. So you have uh, something bright that you consider to be basically the center of your reference frame. Um, and then you hopefully measure some companion or something um, also in the field of view of your detector. Um, and you can get something like the position X and Y as a function of time. To get orbits, you need to do this, or even to confirm common proper motion, you need to do this over more than one, more than one epoch. So hopefully you get more telescope time, you can go back and take measurements over and over. Um, and if you're lucky, you'll see that it's moving with the star uh, with the common proper motion um, confirmation that you can do. Um, and also you can start to see um, that it's start beginning to trace out its orbit. So it's, it's fun to be able to see um, it moving and see what can be happening. Um, but then um, on the cart in the cartoon version, it looks like this is relatively straightforward. You just take the measurements, boom, you're done. Um, but of course there are a lot of challenges and limitations to actually performing, um, getting really precise positional measurements, which I'm sure you heard something about yesterday as well. Um, so, one of the things that we, um, we do that helps us relative to something like Gaia is that um, like when you're considering like a visual binary star or something, you don't um, do um, absolute astrometry. So you don't do astrometry relative to some sort of background reference frame. Uh, for the most part, um, especially with direct imaging where we're talking about adaptive optics data, um, the field of views are really small and we don't have um, sources in the field that we can use as, as a reference frame um, in the background. So instead, we, we do relative astrometry, um, which is just measuring, um, you know, the relative position between the star and the object. Um, so that means that an additional thing that I didn't highlight in the first place was that it, instead of just getting the position of the planet or the companion, you also have to worry about getting the position of the star, um, which you know, the way I've drawn it might seem like it's relatively straightforward, but it actually is a complication that I'll talk about um, a little bit later. So what we measure since we're doing relative astrometry is just, um, you know, the positional difference in X and Y. So the difference between this and that, and this and that, just in trying to get this vector. Um, and so if you go um, to papers where they present astrometry for uh, planets uh, or around the directly imaged systems, you usually won't see it. Um, in terms of X and Y, sometimes it's given in delta X and delta Y, um, but normally it's converted um, into a, basically polar coordinate. So we measure um, the convention that's been around for a really long time is that you use um, the direction of due north as the reference point, and then you measure the angle between um, the vector between your star and your planet um, and true north. So what you'll normally see um, in papers is tables of R, so it's just the length of this, and then this angle between north and, and, um, and the center. So R, theta, and T1. And so what we need to do then is figure out how to get um, X and Y and X and Y, and of course the way that we um, are able to get into a coordinate system is because we're measuring this on a grid, not on a PowerPoint. Um, so, 
um, this is what our data, you know, relative, relatively actually look like. So either with, you know, an infrared array, which is typically what we're using, or CCD, of course, there are pixels. And so um, <laughs> translating from um, the coordinate system of pixel space um, into actual on the sky separations um, is where all of the all of the challenges lie going from here to there. So we're going to figure out how, um, at least for the case that I'm talking about for direct imaging, how we go and court and calibrate and use our pixel grid to get the position. Um, so the main thing that you require, of course, is the accurate the exact center of light of the two objects that you're looking at. So um, to start with a little bit of an easier example, um, I'm pulling data from a lot of the data you're going to see comes from the Keck um, NERC 2 camera, uh, taken with adaptive optics, because that's what I have access to. Um, but there's lots of other examples as well. Um, just to sort of demonstrate uh, some of the challenges here, I'm stepping back from direct imaging, which has additional complications to just sort of a simple triple system, relatively simple. Um, so we want to figure out exactly where the center of all of these three objects are. Um, and so, as you probably can imagine, there's a, just like looking at this um, in the middle, you can imagine there's a complications with that because these two are interfering with each other. Um, so I'm gonna focus on this one for now. So let's zoom in here on this uh, tertiary companion up at the top. Um, so this is uh, what it looks like when you get close and or you're trying to get to the point where you can actually figure out where the center of this star is. Um, so hopefully you can see on the projector that this star looks pretty nice. This data actually looks like a nice data set. Um, there's a nice, um, you know, round center of the point spread function right in the middle. And then you can actually see um, the area ring of the point spread function. So that tells you that we should be relatively close to the diffraction limit, which is helpful. Um, so you think on this particular case, we could get um, the, almost the highest precision possible because this looks like it's really good data. So, one of the most useful rules of thumb, if you guys didn't see this yesterday, I'm sorry if I'm repeating it, but it's really helpful, um, is to know what the sort of the theoretical um, or empirical predictions for the best astrometric precision you could possibly get on any source is. And this is what has been um, derived over many, many years through mostly empirical um, measurements. Um, so what, what they find is that the uncertainty on your, your astrometric position uh, just goes as the fullest half max of your point spread function um, divided by the signal to noise ratio of your measurement. So I put a twiddle because um, each of these different authors found a slightly different constant in the middle. It's something like roughly a factor of two difference between them. Uh, but you can always use this to estimate what, what kind of precision you should be able to get if everything else is, is good. Um, so um, Basically, this means that it depends on sort of the wavelength that you're looking at. If you can get to the diffraction limit, so smaller, you know, shorter wavelengths are better, better for astrometry. And of course, as the highest signal noise ratio is possible, more exposure time, et cetera, is really helpful. So now let's assume that this is what we're trying to get to. Come back to our example. Um, so first we need to figure out uh, what the full half max of this is. So let's just look at it in one dimension. So I'll do a little cut through here and act and make a little plot of that. So here's what it looks like when you do the one, one dimensional cut. You can see our nice peak here. Um, you, if you notice back there, you can see that sort of the, the brightest part was actually split between two pixels, but not, not totally atypical, that happens a lot. And then these little lumps are other uh, point spread function features. So we can assume this is roughly a Gaussian to measure the full path max. Um, so I did that um, and we get that it's roughly 0.0 or five arc seconds. So that's really close to the diffraction limit, actually, at this wavelength, this K-band, so 2.2 microns. Um, and then, so we have that for the top of our equation. Um, and then I'm just gonna assume a signal to noise is roughly the peak of this. So let's just say it's 650, it's obviously mostly higher than this. So we should be able to do even better. But using this as an example, if we plug these into our equation, we should be able to get an astrometric precision of 0.000083 arc seconds, so that's 83 micro arc seconds, so like, like the term micro sounds cool. Um, which is also the same as saying that we should be able to center um, the star to 0 0.008 pixels when we know the size of the pixel on this camera. Um, so that's, this is really good, approaching this you know, micro arc second level that we were talking about in the beginning. But if I tell you the actual precision of this measurement, it's actually 200 micro arc seconds. So it's still really good. If you ask you know, other people, you say, oh, this is, this is a really relatively good measurement, but it's nowhere 
really close to that theoretical limit. So it's like a factor of four or more. Um, so in practice, oops, in practice, um, it's really challenging to get to the level um, where you're just dominated by the full path max in your signal to noise. Um, so I want to talk a, a little bit more about why this is the case. Um, but first, I want to do a side note. <laughs> so um, I remember back in 20, um, 2010 that there um, was a lot of excitement about using Kepler data to do astrometry. Um, I don't know if anybody's talked about this. Um, but this is just an example of you know, one of these Kepler sources and what it looks like um, when they would pull it down, what the data actually looks like. Um, so the reason for this um, was because of that equation I showed before. So the full width half max is relatively large on Kepler. Um, so it's something like you know, five to six arc seconds and the pixels were large. So they're, um, the PSF was under sampled. So it was a Nyquist sampled. So it's like four arc seconds. Uh, but the excitement was because the signal and noise was so high that they wanted to get um, to be able to do this precise photometry. So um, there was a paper from 2010 when the, some of the data was first coming out uh, by um, David Monet, who's really, really, really good at astrometry. Um, and this is kind of what he was finding in some of his initial simulations um, and, you know, an analysis of the data. So he was looking at, you know, the magnitude of these Kepler stars, which was, you know, scaling with the signal, making the high the smaller the magnitude, the better the signal and noise. So as you can see, you get this nice curve here where you could get presumably really, really, really good astrometric precision um, because the signal and noise is so high. So precision, the implied precision was as good as 0 0.0001 pixels. It's a really tiny fraction. Um, I don't know, <laughs> this is the end of my discussion of this because I don't know what happened to this. Um, I haven't really seen any papers on it. And I think what ha ended up happening, as far as I understand, is that the systematics are really complicated. For astrometry. So maybe somebody who does Kepler knows more about this and can tell us what happened. But I don't know a lot about this, but I do know a lot about systematics for direct imaging. So let's go through some of that. So um, a lot of the um, examples that I'm going to use are from HR8799, the directly imaged multi-planet system, because um, I have a lot of data and experience on this, but there's um, you know lots of different um, sources that have been used and people have been trying to work on this from all different angles. Um, so what are our sources of error that come in when we're trying to measure, you know, the positions of these, these four planets, which looks like they're pretty good signal noise, we should be able to do a relatively good job. Um, what's, what's limiting us and being able to do better than we can? Um, so one of the first things that we have to deal with um, that I've spent a lot of time thinking about is distortion. So um, you don't have, you know, a system with perfect optics ever. You always have um, some aberrations in your telescope or in your camera that cause it, by the time the light gets down to your detector, um, to not basically be um, square, perfectly square pixels. Is there something going on here? So this is an example from a really nice resource where they talk a lot about all the different sources of um, aberration and distortion that can cause problems for you. Um, it's just this astronomical optics textbook, textbook. So this comes from there. So this is an example of a type of distortion called barrel distortion, um, where you have you know, your pixels are supposed to be perfectly square, but instead um, there's either kind of a bowing in the middle or they bow in like this. Um, so as you can imagine, um, if you have light falling here um, and it's kind of the optics are causing the center of the light to shift this way, it's gonna cause an error in your center measurement, right? So um, this is one example of the kind of thing we have to deal with. So normally um, some people can do, um, and a lot of the optical engineers um, who design these um, these systems can give you an, a relatively good estimate of what distortion you should expect. Um, but usually, um, there's always sources that they don't necessarily account for in their model. So we usually try to measure this on the sky. Um, so um, when we have measured it on sky, what we found is that these aberrations can cause, you know, uh, basically the centroid to move. Um, up to tens of milliard seconds, so way larger than the types of uncertainties that we're talking about being able to derive. So I'm just going to show some examples of distortion maps that's been actually measured for a couple different cases. So um, sort of the, I would call it like the gold standard of deriving distortion comes out of HSP. Um, and this paper, Anderson and King 2003, is a really, really good resource if anybody's trying to um, do any of this kind of work or learn about how it works. Um, the, all the like different equations that they use to derive their solution are there and it's really helpful. Um, so when you see these, this is for WISPIC2 and WISPIC2 had these four different quadrants, so like four different cameras basically all put together. So they had to make a different map for each different quadrant. So that's why there's four. 
Um, and so what you normally see is we, we tend to make these, these little vectors that show basically the position. Um, if you measured a star in a certain position on your detector where it should fall versus where it did fall. Um, and this is kind of the surface that we try to regenerate um, in order to determine how we can um, measure the distortion in the fit board and take it out. So each of these kind of looks like that barrel um, that I showed before, but you can get less more complicated um, distortion and aberration patterns. So um, coming back again to uh, NERC2 on CAT. So this is what its distortion flow looks like. So again, the, the end of the arrow is like where it should be versus where it is this way. Um, so you can see that this is not a nice barrel going either one way or another. There's actually kind of a weird flow going on here um, for NERC2. Um, and then this is for GPI. I to put this, this is the one that I measured kind of more barely. So things on the edges tended to be distorted more than things in the middle. And that's what we measured. Um, so how do we actually measure this? So it requires getting, um, figuring out how to measure, um, get a lot of positional measurements where you either know what the position of the star relative to others should be, or you can self-calibrate it. So again, that Anderson and King paper is um, a really good reference for self the self-calibration method of um, generating distortion. So usually, if you're lucky and you have a relatively large field of view, there's awesome star clusters that you can use. So not only do you make really pretty pictures, but you can gen um, use this to make a distortion map. So for HST, I think they pr primarily use 47 tasks, so it's a, a relatively dense globular cluster. And so what they do is they can look at all of these different um, stars here, uh, provide an estimate of the distortion in each different area of the star or of the, of the camera. So um, you don't just look at one um, particular orientation. So this is the Hubble Heritage image from this. Um, instead, so I'm gonna use the example from a paper on the NERC2 distortion derivation to show the way we actually take the data. Um, so you get your, you have your dense globular cluster, but in order to sample all of the different uh, possibilities for distortion, like for instance, try to figure out like if the X and Y axis are skewed with respect to each other, um, requires you to um, rotate your camera around and get the same stars measured at multiple different orientations and locations with respect to others on the detector. So normally we do this by kind of marching around, taking lots of data, and then trying to, uh, back out what the position should have been based on using another reference frame or again doing a self-calibration where you look at the stars with respect to each other as you rotate around. Um, for uh, GPI, and for a lot of, this is a problem for a lot of the direct image, direct imaging systems since we're not necessarily interested in having a large field of view um, because uh, we care about stuff that's close to the star or the planet. Um, we have trouble when we look at globular clusters, we only see like a couple of stars. So we've tried to do this and there's not enough stars to do it. So uh, in this case, you have to actually um, generate something um, artificial to do your measurement. So we use this thing called a pinhole mask. So this is a relatively common way to do it in the lab before you send your camera off to the telescope. So um, for our, in our particular case, we wanted to do a couple of different things. So we wanted to generate sort of a regular grid of, of pinholes and then make a really cool looking like random grid <laughs> that would look like a globular cluster um, to, 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 to map this. Um, so this, was, this is how we did it. We haven't been able to do it on SCAD for GPI and that's, that's not uncommon for these types of things. Okay, so then you take all this information, you get your positions and you get this flow pattern that maps the distortion and then you have to fit it somehow. So what people use is they, they basically take those vectors and fit either um, a polynomial surface or something more complicated, like in this case, they did a, a spline fit for an ORC2 um, that you can then say, okay, this is what the, the distortion does to my, my stars. Um, every, for every image I take, I'm going to apply an opposite, basically undistortion, uh, move everything back and the, my pixels should be all square. So this is what it looks like, um, the, the solution that you apply um, for an ORC2. Um, so the problem is, um, I mean, this is awesome. This, this works really, really well, but you always have um, residual leftover distortion that is impossible to correct perfectly. So this is one area in which um, we have trouble getting to the perfect, perfect astrometry prediction because we always have distortion that isn't perfectly accounted for. Okay, so let's just say that's, that's all good and that's done. We've done a good job of our distortion. So now let's come back to our data. So um, we've reduced it and we've tried to correct for distortion. Um, so the next thing we have to worry about, and that's a big problem for astrometry, is this. So getting rid of the bright 
um, massively saturated kind of star halo, a point spread function from the star that um, allows us to be able to actually see our planet. Um, so this is actual um, relatively unprocessed data from HR8799 on NERC2. Um, the planets are kind of hiding in here. And so the game in direct imaging, of course, is always to, to try to enhance your signal to noise of your planet by doing the best job you can of getting rid of it. So there's a couple of different things. I think you guys might have seen a little bit about this before, but just to reemphasize, um, sort of all, all direct imaging surveys now make use of this technique or some form of this technique called angular differential imaging. Um, where we try to get, you know, real-time PSF references that we measure on sky. Um, but if you just, you know, kept your camera or your telescope pointed at the same star and didn't move it around or something like that, uh, you would just subtract the planet as well if you just did a simple subtraction. Um, so in our case, and in a lot of the cases of the large telescopes, you basically can just turn off the counter rotation of the telescope um, that keeps your field of view exactly in the same orientation for your um, observation. And what that does is it allows the field of view basically appears to spin around the center of the star. So if you look really closely there, you can see there's a little planet um, that over time, as you take more and more images, is uh, swinging around on the detector while the point spread function remains relatively big. So then you subtract that, um, you figure out an optimal subtraction scheme, which I'm gonna talk about in a second. Um, and then that leaves, you know, if you're lucky, your, your planet's just behind, and then you can you stack everything and get your nice signal back. So this is an extremely powerful technique for revealing the planets, um, but the problem is that depending on how you do this, it introduces astrometric biases. So I'll show you about that. Um, so here's now a, a couple of examples of processed data um, where you have a nice detection of your planet, but you can see how um, you, your, you know, your centroid measurement or your measurement of where the, star, the planet is might be impacted. Um, and so a lot of this has to do with these, so here's the, each of the planets, and then there's these dark regions around it. Those are the self-subtraction um, residuals. So it turns out that like your, the PSF of the star um, tends to be, you know, it varies over time, and you get the best match to any given time with another frame taken close in time. But the problem is then you don't allow um, your planet to have much time to move away from itself. Um, so you get the best subtraction if you subtract a lot of the signal of the planet. Um, and so you see that here, over here you can see that now instead of having a nice circle like you do here, you have like kind of a smush um, of, your, of your planet PSS. So now imagine, okay, you, you have your good signal, maybe I just wanna do like a straightforward centroid calculation. Um, what's gonna happen? So um, one of the most basic ways um, that you may have done in classes or something like that of getting a centroid um, is just to use these, these two centroid equations. Um, so it's roughly like taking an average. So this is just an example um, from this, this web page where they zoomed in on this star. Um, and then you can see the flux values uh, for each of the different um, pixels in this star. You can get a relatively good estimate of the centroid just by multiplying you know, the flux in each pixel times the pixel value and then dividing it by the, the sum of the fluxes. We do that in both directions. So imagine now that like this, this, in this particular case, you don't have any issues with self-subtraction. If all of a sudden you're subtracting a lot of the flux here, or subtracting a lot of the flux here, it's gonna totally move where your center is. Um, so that's, that's a problem. Um, for the most part, people have moved away from doing this sort of basic calculation or basic uh, centroid calculation anyway. And we tend to do um, point spread function fitting instead. So there's a lot of throwing around PSF a lot. So we subtract the PSF of the star but then want to recover the PSF of the planet. Um, so what people tend to do mostly is PSF fitting, um, basically um, trying to come up with a good model of your PSF, either measuring one, um, calculating one from you know, things that are provided, like telemetry from AO systems is a good way that people are going in the future. Um, that could give you a good model. So in this case, this is that, that um, triple system I showed before. Um, and here's what I did to get the astrometry is I did PSF fitting. So here's the data. Um, here's the model. In this case, uh, for the model, I used a star that I observed um, right before this one um, at the same wavelength. So you can see that the, the match in the center is relatively good, but you see how the, there's variation basically already um, in the area rings out here. Um, and that actually is a large source of bias um, for astrometry when you're trying to get to these really, really precise values. Um, so this is what the residual looks like, and you can kind of see um, that there's stuff left over. 
but this tends to be better than just doing a, a relatively simple calculation or just using a simple functional form um, like a Gaussian or something. So what's exciting and I think is where the future of this technique is going um, is some recent uh, work that was uh, led or that Laurent Puyo did in 2015. So this is an awesome paper that is like so much math. <laughs> so if you want, you want to see the math behind this, um, go check this out. Um, so I just grabbed one of the figures that demonstrates how he was able to um, basically take an estimate of what the point spread function of the planet should be from other um, measurements that we have in the field of view, and then uh, estimate also what the self-subtraction should be based on the parameters that he was using for his uh, point spread function modeling. Um, so what he's just showing here, kind of ignore this, this is like a 1D, a 1D version of this. Um, this is a, for a bright companion, so here's what the data looks like when it's raw. Here's what the data looks like after he's processed it, which is, in this case, it's using the CLIP algorithm. Um, so there's various algorithms for PSS subtraction. Um, and then this is what his model is that he is able to calculate. Um, and so you can see how this is a really, really good estimate, actually. Um, so I'll show you some results from this in just a second, using this as a, as a, a technique. Okay, so that's forgetting the position of the planet. So now we have the X and Y position of the planet. Uh, let's come back really quickly to <laughs> what about the star? Um, so um, it turns out that this ends up being one of the more complicated um, sources of uncertainty to get for astrometry of directly imaged planets. So you think that the star should be easy, it's bright, it should have really good low noise. But for the work that we're doing, we actually try, um, because the contrast is so high, we need to integrate for a long time. And what that'll do is make give us a really saturated star. So we don't want, we don't want that. Um, so we, we usually deal with it by using um, sort of a Colting mask or a coronagraph or something like that. So let's zoom, this is NERC2 data again, so let's zoom in on what oh, we use for NERC2, right there, so if you zoom in. Um, so what you're seeing now is a circle that's a coronagraph spot that's uh, 600 milli arc seconds across. Um, and then this is light kind of peeking around from the star. Um, and then normally when you zoom in on these things, you see that it's all dark here. Uh, in this case, you actually see a little, a little um, what looks like a star, and that's actually the star peeking through. So it turns out they did, they did a nice job designing NERC2 a long time ago to have these occulting spots to do this kind of work, um, but they unintentionally made them semi-transparent, <laughs> and they didn't know that this was going to be a feature, and so when people started doing this, they're like, oh, this is awesome, right? It's basically like a neutral density filter. We can see our, our star, and we can get its position under here. Um, so it turns out that, that the un, unexpected you know, good fortune wasn't actually as good as we thought. Um, so what we found out um, was that what happened is that they printed these little pieces of, you know, these little metal films, very thin, on this you know, glass sapphire substrate. Um, and so this is a mask that you can move in and out of your, you know, your, your field of view, like on a separate filter wheel, basically. Um, and so what happens is that substrate introduces you know, a slightly different um, uh, what am I saying, uh, refraction, basically, that the objects have to pass through. So what it turns out happens is um, all the positions shift upward, which is fine, because if it was just one big continuous shift, everything, it's all relative to each other. We're doing relative astrometry, it wouldn't matter. Uh, but what we found when we were trying to calibrate this was that if we look under the chronographic spot, so there's another index of refraction we had to deal with, which is the metal. It wasn't shifting in the same way that it was outside of it. Um, so luckily we could measure this and account for it, but sometimes your good fortune isn't as good as you think it is um, when you're trying to do this complicated work. So that's one thing that you have to account for if you have something like this. Um, but the newer instruments um, like GPI, uh, Sphere, Mageo, all these different um, direct imaging systems have non-semi-transparent chronographs. They have really advanced sort of state-of-the-art chronographs that don't have this feature. Um, and so instead we have to uh, come up with other methods and usually that's by creating reference spots in the field of view outside of the um, outside of the center that are much much fainter that we can use to backtrack where the center of the star is so with gpi what we use um, is this thing called the appetizer grid that um, is these lines that then generate these four different spots that point back to the center of the star so you do this basically so you measure um, the positions of each of these four and then you make x marks the spot and there's the center so one of our biggest sources of uncertainty is that the signal to noise of these spots is not actually that good. So we have an astrometric error here in measuring these that then translates into an error on the star position. 
Uh, for Sphere, I think Skexio and a few other systems, they actually use their deformable mirror to create a, what's called a waffle pattern that does effectively the same thing. It throws these four what they call satellite plots into the field of view, and you can, again, do X marks the spot analysis. Um, so this, this works really well, and it's really helpful, but our, this is one of the most the biggest sources of uncertainty that we have um, in our astrometric measurements right now is getting the star position. Okay, so, so that's it for um, kind of a lot of the different um, sources of error. There's some others that I didn't touch on for time, uh, but if you put all this together and you try to do the best that you can, what is the actual precision that we're getting right now for directly emitted planets? Um, so as I sort of gave away in the beginning, we're at the milli arc second level. So we're not, not anywhere close to the micro arc second level yet. Um, so here's some examples. So HR 8799 again, we get somewhere between three and 20. So three is sort of the best that we've ever done milli arc second. Um, here's another example from Subaru. Uh, so this is GJ504B. They were able to get you know, something like eight milli arc seconds is their best case. Um, and then a couple other things. So this is a Nikki, another, another direct imager. They got three to 10 milliarc seconds. And then an example from MAGAO, the Lick Calcium 15 system, um, they got something like eight milliarc seconds. So um, this is you know, kind of where we were, but now um, some studies are actually finally approaching the milliarc second mark. So as I mentioned before, um, there's this new modeling technique for the point spread function um, that was developed for um, Trying to, trying to do a better job. And so this was implemented in this, this uh, paper I talked about on beta pick. Um, and they were, we were able to get one milliarc second precision. So we finally got to this sort of level that we wanted. Um, and then something similar happened and then results of sphere that people have been able to finally get <laughs> to this milliarc second level. So still nowhere close to the microarc second level, but at least, at least showing some improvement. So is that, okay. <laughs> so let me just go, because I like to end with, and then with Okay. Thanks very much, everybody. Just time for a couple questions for Quinn. Yeah, so um, people usually, um, oh, oh, yeah, sure. Um, she was asking, um, how do you actually arrive at your final astrometric precision? Um, so sometimes people consider each source separately. So they'll say, okay, this is my error from my centroiding. This is the error that's left over from the star. This is the error um, that I think is left over from you know, residual distortion, et cetera. And then you, yeah, you basically add those all together. Oh, most, most of the time when you see it in the literature, people just report the final error of those combined. And it's assumed that that's what they've done. Any more questions? Yeah, I think so. I think that's really exciting. And a lot of people, oh, sorry, gosh. Um, she was asking if um, we can combine um, astrometry from Gaia with a direct imaging astrometry. Um, so that's definitely true. So I think that a lot of, um, for the current systems that we know about, um, people have been predicting what the signal would be from Gaia for those and are excited about the ones that we think they can actually detect. So I think there will be a lot of syner synergy there for sure. Um, I, don't, I don't know exactly what else to say except for I think that yes, that's really exciting. Um, Oh, okay. I think they're subsumed in this because we're usually for this regime we're usually natural guide star um, and so anything we see um, we're hoping is relatively near the star in the first place so um, 
yeah, as basically the farther you go away, the bigger your error will be in terms of the PSF asymmetry. But I think that is probably a lot smaller than these other effects. So we haven't even we haven't even looked at that for direct imaging. But for you know looking at you know the big clusters or something like that, you have to account for that for sure. Okay, I think it's time for a break. Let's thank Queen again.